My name is Lou and I am here in South East London. I had originally planned for you to join us live in the field at Juniper Hall in Surrey, but because of the current situation with coronavirus, like all of you guys watching at home, I'm a little bit restricted as to where I can go. So I'm hopefully going to do my best for you all today. Now, before we get stuck into today's Fieldwork Live lesson, I do have a few shout outs to do. So first of all, massive welcome to Daisy from Settle Primary School. We've got Kingfisher class from Norbury Primary School. Year three should hopefully be here from Dame Allen's Junior School. And to all of the children watching from Sudbury Primary School, your teachers miss you very, very much. We're also lucky enough to have St. Dominic's Primary School and the cutest class name ever. We've got the Otters from St. John's C of E Primary. Do you know Otters, when they sleep, they sleep holding hands? cutest thing ever. And finally, we've also joined by the Lewis family. I will be doing some more shout outs as I go through today, so make sure you listen out for your name. Now today's live lesson is all about exploring rocks and soils, and we'll be aiming to understand how different rocks and soils are formed and what different characteristics this will cause them to have. I'm going to be doing three different activities with you all. The first thing we're going to be doing is taking out or extracting a section of soil so that we can all do some soil profiles together. We're going to have a go at testing some soil pH and we're going to be learning how to describe the different characteristics of soil. So if you've got your live lesson handouts with you ready, you can work through these as we go and you may if you're extra prepared, even have some equipment ready. So I suggest grabbing some colouring pens, pencils, and if you're allowed to bring it inside, a pot of soil so that you are ready to join in with me. Now, lots of you have already pre-sent in some questions for today's live lesson, and I'll have a go at answering some of those a bit later on. If you would like to get involved during this live lesson, you can do that in the YouTube live chat. And I'll, if I've got time, I will answer some of those later on as well. If you cannot see the live chat to the right of the video, please refresh the web page and that should sort that out. Now, if you would like to join into the live chat, you will need to have a YouTube account. So you will need an adult to help you with that. Remember, to treat the live chat for today's lesson just like you would do if you were in school. So only ask the sort of questions or comments that you would if you were in the classroom. Now we do have our teacher moderators in the chat, so they will be keeping an eye on those comments and questions coming in. And we are lucky enough to be joined by Dave and Simon who work alongside me and they're gonna be helping answering some of your questions live. So, Let's kick off with today's live lesson where we're going to be exploring some rocks and soils. Now, when you all go out to explore your natural environments, if you're like me, you will tend to look around and above you, but very, very rarely do we consider or think about what is actually below our feet. Now, soil is something that is often overlooked or forgotten, but actually, if we didn't have it, we would not have some of the outdoor spaces that we know and that we love. And actually, you or I would not be able to survive. Soil is really important because it allows us to grow food, feed our livestock, and provides really important habitats for other plants and animals. It is also a huge storage of carbon, so really, really important in reducing the impacts of climate change. However, we are beginning to reach a point where farmers are saying that our soils only have enough nutrients for 100 harvests left. And with our populations growing, we are building more houses and buildings and we are losing some of those really important vital soil stores. Now, lots of you in your presenting questions have already asked me, what is soil? Now, soil isn't just one thing, but it is a huge mixture of lots of different materials, such as tiny, broken down rocks, dead plants and animals, water, and air. The amount of each of these different materials is gonna influence and change what our soil actually looks and feels like. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you three different activities that you guys can do to allow us to describe and investigate the differences in these properties of soil. 
But first of all, before I go and get my hands dirty, we're going to start off talking about those broken down rocks that we might find. Now, as hopefully most of you will know, we have got three main rock types that we can find on our Earth, and they all have slightly different properties. The causes of these differences is the way in which they were formed. Now, hopefully you may have learned about these three rock types if you've already completed the pre-lesson activities, but we're gonna take a little recap anyway. So let's start off then with igneous rocks. Now, these are really cool because they start off their life as boiling, bubbling, molten magma underneath the Earth's surface or the crust. As this magma cools and hardens, it then forms a solid, which is our rock. Now, this can happen in two different ways. Either we can have a nice big volcanic eruption, which is going to spit up lots of lava. And then when this lava cools really quickly, that will form one rock. Or the other way is our magma can cool really, really slowly underneath the surface of the earth before being blown out as a rock where we can then go and find it. Now, I have actually got some examples of some rocks. So one good example of our igneous rock is granite. Now here, hopefully, you can all see this piece of granite that I have. I'll just leave it there for a couple of seconds so you can all get a good look. Now, because granite is such a hard rock, you can hopefully see on this pestle that I've got that we can polish it to make it look really pretty, okay? It makes it really nice and smooth and shiny. And because of this, we can use it on buildings and it is great for things such as kitchen worktops. Now, if I go a little bit closer, I hope that's okay. Hopefully, you will notice that we've got lots of these different color crystals. Some of these crystals are minerals such as quartz, and I don't know if the camera is going to pick it up. If you can see any sparkles, these are called mica. Now, these quartz minerals are quite large, which tells me that this was formed underneath the surface of the earth because it's cooled slowly. So therefore, started off life underground before being blown out by our volcano. So that's our igneous rock. Now, our second rock type is my favorite, and this is sedimentary. This rock will form when other rocks are broken down into much smaller pieces, otherwise known as sediments, and then these end up at the very bottom of our ocean or our lakes. Now, within these lakes, as well as our rocks, we're also going to have animals swimming around and we've got plants living. And when those dies, the remains of these, plus our sediments, are squeezed and squashed together to create what we know as these sedimentary rocks. Now, sedimentary rocks, such as this piece of shale, okay, hopefully you can see that, are really cool because often you might find fossils inside of them, such as this one here. Now, I found this fossil and had it polished up after one of my holidays in Charmouth in Dorset. If you look closely, hopefully you can see the outline of an ammonite fossil. Now, an ammonite was a creature that lived under the sea until around about 65 million years ago. And they look like a weird cross between a modern day squid and a snail. They're a little bit weird. Now, our final rock is what we call metamorphic. These are caused when existing rocks, such as our granite or our shale, are changed by heat or pressure. Now here, I've got a little coaster that we use around my house. This is slate, okay? Now, some of you have already been talking about slate in the comments box. This, as some of you pointed out, can also be used as roof tiles. Now, you might notice that it looks a little bit like our shale. And that is because to form this one, this one here, our shale, must be put under lots of heat and pressure, which then causes it to turn into this one. So those are our three main rock types that you may start to find broken up within your soils. Before we move on then, I'm just gonna do a few more shout outs because we've had a few more in. So a massive good morning then to 3T and 3K from Birkenhead High School Academy and to all of the children at GHS from all of your teachers. Uh, to everyone from, oh, we've got some questions from these guys later, from Our Lady and St. George, 
who are working towards their quality science mark. You guys are dedicated. And to Anna and Alfie, mum says you guys are amazing. And I'm going to do a bit of a personal shout out to my little cousin, Charlotte. So hello to all of you guys. Um, now, some of you may have heard him. I am actually joined by someone else today. He is a reptile. He has got four legs and he lives in a shell. If you can guess what he is, I may show him to you all a bit later on. Pop it in the little chat box. Now that we know a little bit about how these rocks are formed, we're going to begin to investigate how this is going to influence what our soil looks like. I live in an area in southeast London, which means that I'm in a place called the London Basin. This is somewhere that has been formed over millions and millions and millions of years by being either flooded by rivers or by the melting of glaciers. As a result of this, the soil in this area is formed of lots of different layers, which is what we are going to investigate first. For this activity, we are learning about the basic properties of soil. The next clip that you're about to see, we're going to explore what the soil in the London Basin actually looks like. Okay, so I'll be using this piece of equipment, known as a soil auger, to extract or take out different layers from the ground. To do this, I will place the point of the soil auger into the ground and rotate it until I cannot move it anymore. Depending on what we have under the ground can mean that it can be quite tough work. The auger has this spiral shape that means as I drill into the ground, it will take samples of the soils that when I pull it out, we will be able to see the different layers. Here we can see the top layer of the soil. Because it is near the surface, it is slightly damp and full of organic matter, such as roots and dead plants. Here in the London Basin, it is really deep, so I'll keep drilling and I will show you what I found. So I kept drilling the auger into the ground and it pretty much totally disappeared up into the handle. When I pulled the auger out, I found some layers which I placed in this jar. How many different layers can you see? Tell us your answer in the comments box. I'll give you 10 seconds. It can be quite tricky to identify the number of layers from a photo, so I'll break it down for you. The very first layer should be quite easy to identify. It's our grassy section at the top. Moving on down, we then have this layer, which is made up of shingle or pebbles. This was incredibly difficult to drill through. Below this, we then have this large area of brown, which we can actually split into two. On the top, we have some very dark, rich soil, which is what I showed you a minute ago, and is full of all those dead plants. This is known as the topsoil and is the newest section. Just below it, we have a lighter brown soil before reaching this orange color at the very bottom. So in total, that is five layers. If you counted the same or similar to me, good job. So using these layers, I'm going to create a soil profile. Now a soil profile is a picture that shows someone just how many different layers we found, the size of each of these layers and the colors. For this, you will need the live lesson handout, which has this little box in the corner. You will need a pencil so that we can do some drawing and you will need some colouring pens so that we can colour in each of the layers. Okay, here we go. To start off, we're going to draw the outline of the jar. I'm going to do this in pen, but I would recommend that you do it in pencil. Next, to make it a little bit easier, with our pencil, we are going to draw each individual layer. At the top, we had this thin layer of grass, and then below it, we had our thinner layer of shingle. Then we had our slightly larger layer of topsoil, followed by our biggest layer of subsoil before the small orange layer at the very bottom. Now that we have created our layers, we can start to add some colour. We can see from the jar that the top bit was mostly grass. This grass is very clumped together and has a lovely green colour. So I'm going to take a green pen and draw some grass above my top layer. If we turn our grass sample over, we can see that underneath there are lots of really tiny little kind of orange and brown roots. 
So I'm going to take my brown pen and draw some roots that go slightly into the layer below. Now these roots are quite messy, so I'm going to make them cross all over each other as I go. Now for our next layer down, we can see that it is made up of mostly grey shingle. So I'm just going to grab a grey pen or pencil and draw in a load of different pebbles. Now these can be lots of different sizes and they can cross over each other and fill up most of the gaps. Moving on down, I have got some of the soil next to me, so I'm going to rub this on my sheet. We can hopefully start to see the colours that appear for each of our layers. For this first layer, we can see that this soil is really, really dark. It's almost grey or black. So if you've got a colour pen or pencil that matches this, please shade in the layer in that colour. I will now do the same with our larger layer. As I rub it on, can we see that there is a colour difference? To me, it looks like the colour is slightly lighter in brown. So if you've got a light brown colour, feel free to shade the layer in this colour. Let's just move that out of the way. Finally, let's rub on this last layer. We can instantly see that this layer is very, very different in colour. It is a bit more of an orange or a yellow. If you want to be creative, you can shade your colours together to create something similar to what you can see. And there you have it. Hopefully you now have in front of you a brilliant scientific drawing of a soil profile. Fantastic then, so those of you that managed to guess that there were five layers in that jar, good job, even I found that quite difficult to see. Now once you guys have finished with your drawings, I would love to be able to see them. With the help of an adult, why don't you take a photo and then post them on Twitter or Instagram and share it with the hashtag FieldWorkLive. Okay, so before we move on to the next activity then, I do have a few more shout outs. Mrs. Hart and Mrs. Money say well done to all the children watching from Caroline Haslett. We have children from Hempston class at Usselbury Primary. Hope I said that correctly. Um, we've got Elm class from Coldas St. Mark's and hello to all the year threes from Damers. Now we've had loads of comments coming in about what you think my little pet is and I'll get to him now for you. Oh, he's bringing something with him. My little pet is in fact, a tortoise. So he does look a bit like a real life rock, so he fits in quite well. His name is Rexy, which is short for T-Rex because he looks a little bit like a dinosaur. And normally we would find him somewhere a bit like Russia running around in the desert. Maybe not running, he doesn't always move quite that quickly. So he's going to stick around for the rest of the lesson. I might potentially pick him up again later, but I'll let him eat that dandelion for now. Let's hop him back. So, now that we've had a little look about how our soil is made up, we can begin to look at how that soil changes as we move around to different locations and what impact this has. So the next thing that we're going to investigate is soil pH. Now it's important to know the pH of our soil as this is going to influence the type of plants that you can grow. This is super important for people like farmers who grow crops for us to eat or floriculturists, difficult word to say, who grow lots of flowers for garden centres and flower shops. If a farmer had a soil that maybe had a pH of about eight, this would make it alkaline and not suitable for growing crops such as potatoes or strawberries. Equally, if our soil was too down the other end and was too acidic, the plants would not be able to absorb all of the important nutrients they need to grow, so therefore we wouldn't have any plants. In order to change this pH to make it right for the plants we need, we can add things like fertilizers, manure, or compost to change it. Now, hopefully you've all learned about pH from your pre-lesson handouts. If you haven't, you can always look back over that at the end. Now, a pH test, like the one I'm about to use, will tell us just how acidic or alkaline something is. 
We're going to now test the pH of a couple of different soils that I collected from my garden. Now the soil that I used was from at least five centimetres below the surface to stop the wind, rain or sun from changing it too much. Whilst you're watching the next clip, have a go at recording the steps to our method in your handout. You might decide to draw diagrams or even just write in some key words. For my first step, I'm going to place a teaspoon of my soil sample into the smaller pot. For my second step, I'm going to add half a teaspoon of this compound, which is called barium sulfate. This will make the water which I'm going to add turn clear instead of muddy, which should allow us to be able to read the pH. Next, I'm going to add two-ish teaspoons of deionized water. Deionized water is just water that has been purified so that it doesn't change the pH of our soil. And then, if I can put the correct lid on, I'm just going to shake it all together. Once the water has settled a little bit, I'm going to add some of this liquid, which is called Universal Indicator. At the moment, this solution is a brown red colour. When I add it to our mixture, it should change to tell me the pH. I need to add 10 drops in total and then swish it around to mix it in. Finally, I will compare the colours on this small sheet to the layer on top which has changed colour. If I hold the sheet next to it, can you tell what pH our soil has? I will give you 10 seconds. It's a little bit tricky, but I think it looks most like 4.5, which means that our soil is very acidic. Here is a reminder of the six steps I took to test soil pH. From the clip then, we have discovered what the pH of the soil of my garden is, so it sits around that 4.5-ish mark. Again, I would love to see the methodologies you guys have made, so please again share them with us on Twitter or Instagram and use the hashtag FieldworkLive, but don't forget to ask for permission first. Now if that clip was a little bit quick for you to finish them off, don't panic because this video will be available afterwards so you can always go back and finish them off. Then, right then, time for some more shout outs. You guys have been really busy. First of all, Mrs. Weaver wants to give a big shout out to all her budding geologists in Willow class from Trinity Church School. That's a mouthful. Um, all the children at Highfield Primary School in Farnworth. Hello to all the super scientists at Lineker Primary School, where the soil is apparently very sandy. I like you guys have done some pre-work on that. And Mrs. Harper says hello to the Willow class from at Cuddington Community Primary School. Finally, hello to Oscar, who has joined us live every single day for the past three weeks. Go you, you win the Super Scientist Award. So, so far then, we have looked at how you guys can create your own soil profile, as well as measuring pH. Now we're going to look at how you guys can investigate soil at home using just your hands, okay? There is a page in the resource pack for the next activity where we're going to be learning to identify the different types of soil. If you would like to join in, you need to be prepared to get a little bit messy, so make sure you're not wearing your favourite clothes and 
have a bucket of warm soapy water ready so that you can wash your hands at the end. For our final activity, we are going to be identifying how soils might be different. We're going to be focusing on their characteristics. So to do this, you are going to need to collect two soil samples from two different locations. Now, just like with the pH of our soil, you need to make sure that the samples you take are at least five centimetres below the top of your surface. The reason for this being the same as before is the top of your soil can be changed by the wind, the rain and the sun. But before you go digging up areas around your garden, please make sure you ask for permission, otherwise someone might be very unhappy. Now I have selected two different soil samples which are here in these pots. I didn't take them from two different locations, what I did instead was I took them from two different layers, just like we looked at earlier in our soil profile. Location number one, which is this one here, was taken quite far down and location number two was taken quite near the surface. Just before I even put my hands in them, I can have a look to see how they are different. If you have your own samples in front of you, please leave a comment in the comments box to tell us how your soils are different just by sight. Now that I've had a bit of a look at them, I'm going to get my hands a little bit messy. So first of all, I'm going to take off my soil from location number one. And with slightly damp fingers, on my worksheet in the boxes that say location one, I am just going to rub it on. And then I'm going to repeat the same thing with location number two. What you should then get is in your boxes, two really nice rubbings of your soil. From this, you should be able to see how the colors are different and maybe start to see how some of the textures change. Looking at my two, I can clearly see that the soil in location one is quite orange in colour and is much lighter than the soil in location two, which is very dark brown colour. Now that we've looked at the colours, we can have a little bit of a think about their textures. I'm going to start off with location number one. I'm going to grab a little bit of it and I'm going to roll it in between my fingers. What I am looking for here is I want to see the texture, so I want to see if it's nice and smooth or if it's gritty, a bit like sugar. This one from location number one, I can tell you, feels quite gritty, in fact it feels a little bit like sand on the beach. I'm now going to do the same for location number two. I'm going to grab this little bit that was at the top and rolling it around in my fingers, I can already tell that it feels a bit damper, in okay, case so it's a bit more wet in its texture and it feels really, really smooth. In fact, the only things that I can feel inside it are actually just bits of organic matter, so things like leftover roots and dead plants. This would make sense seeing as that I found layer number two, or location two, near the very top, and location number one was found much lower down. Finally, we are going to work out how much clay is in each of these samples. You may have used clay before in something like art at school in order to make little models or bowls or cups and it can be described as having quite a sticky and smooth texture. In order to work out how much clay is present in our two samples of soil, we're going to use the ID key that you have on the bottom of your worksheets. All I'm going to do is start off by taking a small amount of soil from location number one answer and look at the first question which asks me can you roll it into a ball between your fingers so I'm going to start off with a small bit between my fingers and you might be able to see that actually I cannot roll this one into a bowl at all it is too crumbly and just falls apart so to that first question we answer no which tells me that the soil does not contain any clay so we are finished with this one now I'm going to have a go with the soil from location two. So again, I'm going to take a small amount out of the pot. I'm going to try and leave some of the rocks behind. There's a massive rock there. Okay, and again, I'm going to take a little bit between my fingers and try and roll it into a ball. This one does not crumble and fall apart. And actually, if I use both hands, 
I can roll it up into a small kind of pea-sized amount. That means I can answer yes to this question and move on to the next one, which asks me to make it into a long, thin sausage. It's a bit like I would do in Play-Doh. I'm just going to roll it between my hands and see what happens. Okay, so I can actually turn this one into a long, kind of thin sausage which means that I can move on to my next question, which asks me to turn this sausage into a C shape. Now, I think I already know what is gonna happen. Yeah. The moment I try to bend it, it falls apart, which means that I answer no to that question, which means that this soil does contain quite a lot of clay, but it has other things in it as well. Finally, if you've ended up, especially if you've ended up with hands as muddy as mine, you need to make sure that you wash them down because we don't know what is in this soil. I just had ready a really nice bowl of warm water with a bit of soap in it, which I'm going to wash them off with before going and cleaning them under a proper tap indoors. Brilliant. So now you guys should be able to describe soil in four different ways. You should be able to tell people all about soil pH and what this means for things growing inside it. You should be able to talk about its colour, its texture or how it feels and the amount of clay it contains. Have a go at testing soil from different locations or maybe from different depths and have a go at filling the space in the resource pack. But remember, once you've finished, it's really important to wash our hands as we don't know what has been in our soil. Right then, before I move on to answering some questions, we've had a few shout outs from the live chat. So hello to, I can't see it now, Jaden, hello, Answer, Theo, Naraya, Narayan, Izzy, and Monks Coppen Hall. We've also had a teacher, I just need to get my phone up for this one, a teacher, we've had Mrs Curry, would like to say hello to all the children at Witten Gilbert Hall Primary School who are working so hard at home, and you guys apparently already know all about fossils and rocks, so you should be well ahead of the game. Now, during this video, we've had some really interesting questions submitted about this soil exploration. We will see if we can help to answer some of these questions that have come in. Now, the first superstars are from Our Lady Star of the Sea. Your teacher, Mrs. Lyons, told me you guys all love science. You have sent me in absolutely loads, okay? So first up, Elise has asked, why is soil always brown? Well, if I get this back up, hopefully you guys can now see from doing this soil profile that actually soil is not always brown. The colour of the soil is caused by the different minerals and organic matter that we can find within it. So if you were to visit different places such as Devon, you might even find bright red soil. All right then, let's move on to the next one. So Noreen, again from the same school, wants to know how many different types of soil are there? Well, as you should now know from your handout, which I've lost, Oh, it's there. As you should now know from your handout, there are six main types of soil which you can see. So these are chalky, clay, loamy, sandy, peaty, what's the last? Oh, and silty. Nearly forgot that last one there. Um, again, from Our Lady Star of the Sea, we've got James who asks, how long does it take to make soil? Oh, this is a tough question. It's a really good question, but it's a really tough one. Well, as you guys all now know, new soil is made when things break down or have died, otherwise known as decomposing. And in the UK, the general rule is that to make just one centimetre of soil, it takes between 200 to 400 years. And to create enough soil for things to actually start to grow, this can take around 3,000 years. Okay, so the answer, it's a really, really long time. Now, if we went somewhere to like a rainforest where it's really hot and quite damp, that time will be shortened a little bit. Okay, uh, the Lewis family, they want to know how deep do we have to dig before we get to Australia or just anything interesting? Well, guys, just to get to the centre of the earth, you would have to dig about 6,370 odd kilometres. However, 
You wouldn't actually make it this far because it is full of boiling hot molten magma. Now, if you managed to put on some sort of special suit that meant you could survive in that molten magma and you were to dig straight through, depending on where you are in the world, actually depends on where you would hit. Now, I know that the Lewis family live in Worcester Park, so if they kept on digging, they wouldn't hit Australia. Actually, they would end up in the sea just off the coast of New Zealand. I'd quite like to be there right now, I think. Um, if you just Google it with the help of an adult, there are some really cool interactive maps online that show you where would you pop up if you were to dig straight down from somewhere. So you can go ahead and experiment with that a little bit. Um, we've got, who have we got next? Ah, oh, Emma from Cheltenham has asked, how many different types of worms can we find in our back garden? Well, Emma, the truth is, I don't actually know, okay, because in the UK, we have about 27 different species or different types of worm. And which one you would find in your back garden depends on the soil you have, how deep it is, and what kind of other things you've got around you. If you would like to investigate this yourself, just Google opal, so as in like the stone, so O-P-A-L, opal earthworms, where we actually have some great resources which you can download at home and have a go at finding some worms and identifying them. Right. Oh, another school then that have been very busy sending me some questions are the year sixes from first down school. Now, the first question they've asked is how did that, how do you know just how old a rock is? This is another great question. Again, quite complicated. Scientists use a technique called carbon dating. This is where they test just how much a certain type of carbon, called carbon-14, there is within something. Now, carbon-14 is just a type of carbon that is quite unstable, which means that over time, as things begin to break down or decompose, the amount of carbon-14 within something can change. Now, these clever scientists know how much carbon-14 there is in something and how old that means it is. So they can work out a rough date just by measuring that. They've given us, given us quite a few questions. Let's go for, how can we stop soils from being degraded? Love the keywords you guys are using. So soil degradation is just where the quality of our soil is reduced. So there may be less nutrients within it, so things that our plants need to grow, or it may just erode or disappear. To stop this from happening, there are a few things that can be done. Firstly, some places are putting in things like natural windbreaks, like extra shrubs and plants. This stops the wind from being able to erode and take away our soil. And then anything that falls off our shrubs or our plants will then begin to decompose and turn into topsoil. So that's a bit of a win-win both ways for that one. Another thing we could do, particularly for farmers, is instead of always just growing the same crop in one location year after year after year, they can do something called rotation. This is where they may grow some wheat in one field for maybe two years, and then they'll move it on and give that field a little bit of a break. That's great for our soil because it can sit there, it can give a huge sigh of relief because it's worked really, really hard, and then it can begin to rebuild itself, which then means our crops will grow a bit better the next time around. Right, we'll do one final one from First Down School. My favourite topic, fossils, okay? They've asked, what is the most interesting fossil that I found within a rock? Now, as I showed you earlier, if I can find it, I've left it somewhere, there it is. As I showed you earlier, I used to go on holiday down to Charmouth in Dorset, where I'd be able to find lots of fossils such as this ammonite. However, when I was about 10, I went on a fossil hunt, which was led by a ranger down there, and we found part of a, got to get this right now, ichthyosaurus, ichthyosaurus, okay, which means lizardfish. They're really cool. It was just sat, implanted in a rock, waiting for us to come along and see it. If you want to know what it looks like, help, ask an adult to help you just type it into Google. They're really cool. Go on, we've got time, I reckon, for one final question. We'll do Anna from Our Lady and St. George School. Wants to know, why do, why do scientists find soils so exciting? Well, you guys are now all fossil, uh, fossil soil scientists, okay? And the reason why we get so excited about it is because it's just so important to us. 
as I said earlier, we need soil to actually grow food and help us store carbon to reduce the impacts of climate change. The reason I like studying soil is you never really know what it is you're going to find. Okay, when I did that soil extraction the other day, which you all saw earlier, I've never done that to the soil around where I live, so I didn't know what I was going to pull out, and that was really quite exciting. And hopefully, now that you guys have watched this live lesson, you will find it exciting too. I really hope you have all enjoyed this soil exploration, but don't let this stop your exploration there. Why not try doing things like painting with soil? You can make soil faces, or even my favorite thing I used to do is creating a wormery to see how different animals use the soil beneath our feet. Make sure you ask permission though before painting soil everywhere as you might get in a bit of trouble. If you would like more resources such as, I've lost them now, oh, they're here. Such as sold out keys like this one. So lots of you have been asking me things like, can I show you a rock? Can you tell me what it is? You guys can do that yourselves. If you go along to the fieldwork.live website after this, we have got a huge discount, especially for you, on all of these kind of keys, which can tell you what fossils you found, what rocks you found, and maybe what different minerals you found. Um, we've got a lot more to come in FSC Fieldwork Live 2020. This is only the first day. So make sure you visit the Ed Encounter Edgy website and fieldwork.live to find out more about what's coming up and how you can get involved. We've got lessons for lots of different ages. So we've got your age group, seven to 11. We've got 11 to 14, 14 to 16, and 16 to 18. So if you've got any older siblings at home, make sure they're doing some work as well, okay? Now, tomorrow's lesson is on weather and climate. So head over to the website to check it out and register for more live lessons if you haven't already done so. If you are a teacher that is watching this, we are running some live webinars after this, um, looking at how you can build and what we've done in this morning's live lesson. You will need to register for those. So again, head over to the fscfield.live website to find out more about when these are happening. Lastly, I would love to hear what your thoughts were on today's live lesson, because again, it was my first one. So you can do that again on the Fieldwork Live website or in the live chat here on YouTube. One final thanks I need to do is to a person you cannot see, is to Ellie, who is working here behind the scenes with me. She's been the one that's made all of what you guys can see possible today. So thanks so much for joining us in Fieldwork Live. Oh, if I can pick him up. Rexy says thank you and goodbye as well. And please make sure you sign up to other Fieldwork Live lessons. Bye.